always a small group. This concept of iridology is a very niche concept. So we don't attract the massive crowds that the people who do webinars about business building and make a million bucks and lose 25 pounds in a week. We don't attract those kinds of big crowds. So we're kind of cozy. And that means that I invite you to participate really well with me to um, just to build some energy here. So again, welcome. I am so glad you are here. Today we are talking about an introduction to iridology and I just need to make sure I have my teaching notes open. There we go. Um, because my Zoom isn't behaving and it's not letting me have my teaching notes on my screen. So when I look away from the camera, it's just to make sure that I'm talking about what I'm supposed to be talking about. So my name is Judith Cobb. I'm a master herbalist, natural nutrient clinic natural nutrition clinical practitioner, a certified iridologist and a certified iridology instructor. I would love to know a little bit about you. I'd, I'd love to know again, who put the teeth in straight tomorrow. I'd love to know where you're from. I'd love to know what your background is in holistic practicing. Do you, um, are you a herbalist, a nutritionist, an energy worker? What do you do? I'd love to know that because I can tweak this presentation a little bit on the fly to meet the needs of those who are attending. So the more you tell me about yourself and you can send it to me privately in the chat, you don't have to broadcast it to the universe if you don't want to, the, the more I can actually make this, this time that we spend together very useful for you. It's really important that we recognize that there are a lot of different styles of iridology out there. There are many philosophies. I have studied many of those iridology styles and I have finally, about 30 years ago, I've been in this for about 40 years, so for four decades. And about three decades ago, I really um, was looking at the idea of leaving iridology altogether because what I had learned originally wasn't working. It wasn't helping me in my practice. It wasn't helping my clients. It was actually a gong show. And I was about to leave iridology when I learned constitutional iridology. Thought I'd give this one one more chance. And I'm so glad I did because learning constitutional iridology, which has a lot of scientific validation, it's very up to date. There's research continuing with it, has just been a blessing for me and for my clients in my practice. And so I'm going to share ideas about constitutional iridology with you. Now, I would just love to make sure that you can hear me. So if you um, would please let me know that we've got good audio, just a comment or raise your hand or something like that, that would be grand. And let me know too, if the slides are not progressing Okay, if, if we end up stuck on a slide, let me know. We've had that problem with Zoom lately where the slides have not progressed. They've progressed on my screen, but not on other people's screens. So would you let me know that as well, please? That would be awesome. And I'm just going to... There we go. Okay, so just in case uh, we've got an audio problem and you're seeing my lips move, but you're not hearing anything, uh, hopefully you'll see the chat message come in. Awesome possum. Alrighty, so we're going to answer three questions today. The first one is what is iridology? The second is what can it teach us? And the third is how should it be used? These are critical questions. And then we're actually going to answer a couple more questions as well. Consider these bonus questions if you want. They are, uh, we're gonna do a little look at iridology and its evolution. And we're also going to do some case studies. So if case studies get you excited and help you to see the inner workings of something, then great, we are going to do that as well. And I encourage you to ask questions as we go. If I'm saying something and you're going, huh, what? please let me know, right? Let me know because I can take a moment and answer that for you. Here again, here am I, um, a totally posed picture. And, you know, if you are new to me, welcome. It's good to get to know you. 
I have been at this, like I said, for four decades. I am the wife of one, the mom of seven, and the grandma of eight. And I've been told to expect that in the next year or so, there might be a few more babies. There's no formal announcements, but I know some of our kids are planning on it. So that's kind of fun. I studied nutrition, herbology, iridology. I started off with Jensenian iridology. And then, like I said earlier, 10 years later, I had to jump ship because it just wasn't working for me. But then again, it's really great to learn lots of things and to, to learn things and try them on for size and decide if it's actually going to work for you or not, right? Does it mesh with your beliefs? Does it mesh with your style? And so that was, it was a valuable lesson for me to learn that and a few other styles of iridology thrown in. But again, it was when I learned constitutional iridology and played with it for a little while that I learned how to integrate it with the nutrition and the herbology and all of the other wonderful things that I'd already learned. And learned that what I really learned was that when I used iridology to integrate everything, it simplified the process. It simplified what I was doing with my clients. It made it easier for them to stick with programs. And that was very exciting for me. So what exactly is iridology? How does it help us? Let's look at this. So first off, it's called iridology, not iridology, because we're looking at the iris of the eye or the eye rides of the eye. So when we're talking about iridology, technically, we are looking at the colored part of the eye. We are looking at the fiber structure. We are looking, are there other colors? Like there's this little teeny patch of brown right here. We're looking for uh, the way the fibers are sitting in the eye. We're looking for all kinds of things. Now, most of us as modern iridologists also include the sclera or the white of the eye, where the iris is genetic. It's what we've inherited and it shows us our inherited health patterns, our strengths and weaknesses. The sclera shows us what we're doing with it. This shows us what is activated in the body right now. And that's pretty exciting stuff. So again, what we are looking at is we are looking at the iris and we are looking at the white. So the iris would be the iridology and the white of the eye would be sclerology. Now, as we do this, we're also, um, when we do iridology, we also study a little bit about the cornea because the cornea gives us so much information about, um, or can give us so much information about various things that are going on in the body. We need to be aware of the fact that the iris itself, which is cross-sectioned right here and right here, has over 28,000 nerve endings. We don't know what most of those do. We don't have a clue. We're still figuring that out. The other thing we need to be aware of is that the eyeball itself is the largest neural receptor of the body. It is connected directly by one nerve, not a series of nerves, but one nerve to the brain, right? And that's actually, that's not quite correct because it's connected as we're going to see in this next image, it's actually connected by a few nerves, but each of these is just one nerve long, one nerve long. So we have this input device we call the eyeball that sends messages directly to the visual cortex in the brain. And, and what we know beyond that, you know, we've got other inputs coming into the visual cortex as well. But we know that these nerves that end up in the iris, in the iris, develop at the very same time as the rest of the nervous system, as the rest of the brain. And so what we know is that if there is something unusual in the iris, it correlates to something unusual in the brain. And that is how we can use iridology to help us understand what is going on in a body. So again, when we're doing, uh, doing iridology, we are primarily studying the iris. We are looking for inherent tendencies. So the markings, the colors, the way the fibers are sitting in the eye, those are all inherent. 
That's all what we got from our parents, from our grandparents. And when we see these markings in the eye, it's not a guarantee of a problem. It is a potential of a problem. And that's important for us to recognize because our clients may be doing a lot that's really right. And it may be helping to keep something that's inherent under control. That's brilliant. That's what we like to see. And that's actually why we do iridology. We need to know that because the way the fibers are laying in the eye is genetic, they're not going to move because we've changed the diet. These fibers down here that are doing their own thing, they're not gonna change their position because we put this person on the right herbs. This is inherent. It's not going to change. We also know that the base color of the eye is not going to change. We're not going to turn these, turn say blue eyes brown or blue eyes, um, sorry, brown eyes blue or eyes that are hazel. We're not gonna make them go blue either by quote unquote fixing the diet because that the color is inherent. We also know that there may be a few changes that happen in the iris over time and that those are a part of that person's inherent aging process. All right, just like my hair was scheduled to start turning gray about six years ago, I could do things to delay that potentially by a bit, but aside from artificially coloring my hair, I'm probably not gonna do much, be able to do much about my hair going gray. So we need to take into account when we do iridology, what is the base color? Are there any other pigments? What is the fiber structure? Are there anything, any unusual things? And if there are not, that teaches us a lot too. What is going on in the sclera? We also need to know what this client's diet and lifestyle are like. So we need to know that iridology itself is not a standalone tool. It works with other assessment tools. So it works with us having a conversation with our client. It works very well with that. So predispositions that we see in an iris may be active and maybe correlate to the client's symptoms or they may not be active because maybe the client isn't old enough. Maybe the client has not done enough really awful things to their body yet. Or maybe the client is actually taking good care and it's helping these predispositions to not show up. So for example, in this iris, um, without any client information, this iris suggests that this is a person who is prone to being over acid in their tissue. This is someone who I would ask about their digestion. Are there any foods that upset their stomach? How do they handle dairy products and proteins especially? I would want to know if this person had any arthritic symptoms. I would want to know about joint health. And those are some things that this eye tells me. I wouldn't ask those questions if the client came in with a list of symptoms that I couldn't tie in to what I see. For this client, she was age 51 when we took these photos. She had minor hip issues with her left hip and we referred her out for medical massage. She also wanted help with menopause because she was PM, um, PMSing a lot <clears throat> and her hormones were starting to be loopy with, uh, with being perimenopausal. And so she wanted a little help with that. Again, what I did with her was I focused on the gut. I focused on her digestion by giving her enzymes and probiotics because everything starts there. If she's not digesting well, what else are we gonna do? And her eyes suggest that her gut inherently, her stomach especially inherently, is potentially a weak link for her. Her job is really stressful. And so her pupil, um, I know how much light my camera throws and I know how it affects the pupils. And so these pupils are actually a little bit large for my camera. And um, they don't look large here, but in regular daylight, they are quite large. And so that suggested to me that we also needed to do some B vitamins and some adrenal gland support with her to help her deal with the amount of stress she was under. Does that all make sense to you? I'd love to know if those things actually line up for you.
Now, again, modern iridologists have uh, often have a bit of a background in sclerology as well. And when we study the white of the eye, we are looking for what are the blood vessels doing in there? So we're looking for, are they really, do we have some that are thick and squiggly? Are there some that are kind of paralleling the edge of the iris to a certain extent? Do we have others that might be attached to the edge of the iris in a very fine net? There's lots of different things we can look for here. And oftentimes when we are looking at something in the sclera, the more prominent it is, the more clinical it is. And if this was instead very faint and very thin, we would know it was probably preclinical that this client probably was having no symptoms, but that something was brewing. So we can ask those personal and family history questions and we can do things then to avert problems down the road. Alrighty, any questions so far? Or are we good? While you're pondering if you've got a question and if you're maybe typing one in, great, I'd love to answer it for you. Let's look at a bit of the history of iridology and we're gonna come back around and do a bunch of case studies in a little bit here. This is rooted in ancient cultures. We know that Egypt, India, China, Greece, they all had this in their history, right? We also know that science evolves. So where iridology was 150 or so years ago is not where it should be now. And so when we think about science and we think about how, you know, several hundred years ago, they thought the earth was flat, right? Now we know it's round. We know that science evolves and we need science to evolve. We need people to ask good questions and to run studies and to be observant, to figure out how things really are. And so again, the things that we learned years ago about iridology, we now know are probably not true. Many of them we know are not true and we know much more of what is accurate. And we are open to the idea that what we think is accurate right now could be disproved. It's so important to let this evolve. So we go back to the earliest roots of iridology where we have in 1826 in Hungary, a little boy, an 11 year old boy named Ignaz van Pechle. Now the story about Ignaz goes in so many different directions that we're really not sure what is the truth here. How much of this is fact and how much is fiction? The story goes that he trapped or caught an owl or a hawk and either this, this bird either already had a broken leg or a broken wing or it got broken in the process of being caught. Do you see how many variables there could be in here? And we, and it, it said that as this, this young boy was nursing this bird of prey back to health, he noticed a black line form or that was in the bird's iris that disappeared as the bird got better. What we know now is, there's a couple of things. What we know now is that a bird, most animals, eyes and especially birds are very different from human eyes. They have a very different build to them and so we cannot extrapolate um, one thing from another here. What we do know is that what Ignaz described that he saw is not possible in a bird's eye. Okay, so I don't know where the idea came from. I also have to wonder if what he saw was accurate. Don't we have a lot of veterinarians and people who work in wild bird sanctuaries that nurse injured wild birds back to health, wouldn't they have noticed something like this as well at some point in time? And no one has ever reported it. So we have to take what Ignaz um, said he saw. We have to love him for the fact that it spurred his interest somehow into actually starting to study the human eye and create maps. And it, um, but that's where, where we have to end because Ellen Tart Jensen, who's a well-known iridologist in the US said this, even August von Petschle, 
who was Ignatz's uncle, I believe, recognized years later that Ignatz was looking at an owl's eyes and not that of a human, and that he did not have the proper equipment to prove what had been recorded in the stories. It is time for iridology to move forward based on sound research rather than hearsay. Totally agree. Then we move on to Pastor Nils Lilliquist. Now, he very correctly identified by looking at many people's eyes, often drawing them with, with colored charcoal, that the density of the fiber, so how many threads per square inch, had a real correlation to how resilient this person's overall health would be. So he would have said this person had the potential to have much more robust health, much more resilient health. They could bounce back from things faster. They could ward things off more easily than someone who had a much more loose fiber structure. He also suggested that pigments in the eye were the result of toxic exposure, but we now know that that is not true. We now know that this is simply melanin. So it's the same pigment that gives us a suntan. Um, that and it can be deposited in the eye just as a matter of course because of our inherent and genetic potentials. Then we have Emanuel Falco. What I love about these European and German iridologists who were pioneering this research is they were doing this research at the same time without knowing that the other people were doing this research at the same time. And yet they were coming up with very similar observations in many cases, which to me is very, very exciting. So where, where Pastor Lilliquist uh, had mapped out the iris, so did Pastor Emmanuel Felke. He also had diagrammed out the iris based on his studies with human, with human beings, which is exciting. Rudolf Schnabel researched, did research into pigment, so the little freckles of color that we see in a person's eye, and into pupil tonus, so the size of the pupil and the shape of the pupil. We like to think pupils are always round. They are not. And he was able to correlate when a pupil is not round, why it's not round, and what it means for imbalances in the body and what can be done with that. Rudolph was one of the very first people to actually use a microscope to examine an iris. So that's pretty cool stuff. Up until now, people were just looking at other people's eyes, just eye to eye, or they were using very weak magnifying glasses, like a two power magnifying glass. It's amazing what they were able to accomplish with that. Rudolf Schnabel said it was no easy task and those who believe or would like to believe that handling iridoscopy or as we call it now iridology can be learned within a few weeks or even days are mistaken and do a disservice to a good cause. I underscore this because of the number of classes I see that are offered that are very short, that are just one or two days long or that are you know 10 lessons of self-study. And I think my goodness, how could you learn anything of value in such a short period of time and claim to be an iridologist. That's frightening. It's like a medical doctor um, practicing on humans after just, you know, like not even a year of, of training or a dentist doing that after just a year of dental school. It's scary stuff. Jo Joseph Onger was actually a student of Schnabel's. Doesn't he look like a lovely man? I would have loved to have met Joseph. I think he just, he looks so lovely and so joyful and so gentle, very nice. He knew though that his students were reading books and accepted the printing printed word about iridology before adequate research was completed. So as he did his research, he refused to publish anything for the masses until it had been reviewed and put to the test by his peers which I think is exciting, and I think it's extremely responsible. Then we have Joseph Deck. We love Joseph Deck. He looks like he's posing as a movie star, right? He looks like he's doing a, um, a Cary Grant pose there. He is the father of constitutional iridology. Tons of research went into this, and he he pioneered iris photography, which is exciting because of course now we rely on iris photography. And he was also an instructor and it was his original book 
written in German that, and we're going to talk about this more in a moment, that was the launching point for constitutional iridology in North America. So we're very excited to, to know his history a little bit. Theodore Krieger was a student of Anger, Deck, and Schnabel. So he knew all three of them. And he felt that iridology was a powerful assessment tool and that it should always be used in conjunction with other assessment tools. So he favored things like urine analysis, reading the hands, the fingernails, the tongue, the feces. He really believed that this should be an integrated part of a holistic assessment. And I think there's wisdom in that. In 1962, he said, I hope that a later gen generation will succeed in establishing a single uniform system. In spite of zealous efforts, these have so far not succeeded. And of course, we struggle with that now with having the Jensenian crowd, the Morse crowd, the Pesic crowd, the constitutional crowd. We have the behavioral iridologists, the rayed iridologists, and everybody is coming from a slightly different angle. In the modern world, we have Bernard Jensen, who of course was in California and um, he kept iridology alive in North America during the Cold War. So we had all of this research going on in, in Europe, in Germany especially, and there was no information coming out from Europe at that point in time. So Bernard was working with some outdated information, but he worked with it and he was a brilliant healer. And he kept it alive, even though much, we now know that much of what he was using was inaccurate information because it was the best he had. Um, he kept it alive. And for that, we are ever so grateful. Then in 1980-ish, Harry Wolf, who was an American born German, got a hold of the Joseph Deck book that was written in German. And since Harry was fluent, he read the book and went, oh my goodness. And he started spreading the word. Her, uh, Bill Cardona linked up with him and they traveled a lot doing uh, workshops and teaching courses and, and really trying to bring constitutional iridology out to the forefront. Now, Bill Cardona was my actual iridology teacher and I've since, since learning from him, I've connected with Harry and I've studied materials that Harry has produced as well. And I consider Harry to be one of my iridology teachers also. Let's look at some of these common styles of iridology that are out there and do some comparing and contrasting to see where we end up. Jensenian iridology was originally taught by Bernard Jensen. And again, we love that he had the intestinal fortitude and the conviction to keep this alive when actually a lot of North America was, um, was kind of struggling with this where you know he was shut down for teaching holistic things, all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of that going on in the 60s and 70s. He taught that the iris changes when the body changes that we would see healing lines appear in the iris. He taught that the lacuna, lacuna, or as he called them, lesion shape and size could also change. We now know that that is not correct. Then we have rayed iridology, which was taught primarily by Denny Johnson. He was the father of this style of iridology. And he teaches still that emotional traits are genetic and they are revealed by markings in the irides. So the markings that a physical iridologist would interpret for physical health kinds of things, Rayed interprets for emotional and personality trait kinds of things, which is very, very fascinating. Now, in the 30 or so years that Denny has been doing this, even his teachings have evolved. I recently attended a workshop that he presented online and it was radically different from his original book and his original writing. Very interesting stuff. Then we have constitutional iridology. Now, constitutional again originated with Joseph Deck and some of the other iridologists who are based in Europe. It is currently used by medical doctors in Italy, Germany, and Russia as a screening tool. That's very exciting. There are correlative medical studies that are being done and very specifically, there's some great research coming out from um, a, a naturopath in California. 
Um, there was some, there's some more great research coming out from a couple of people that live, I believe they're in the Philippines. And so there's great stuff happening where we're moving forward and we're able to say, you know, what we believed 10 years ago, it's not quite right. And so we're working to keep up with current information and current research. Constitutional teaches that the eyes are a reflection of the genetic structure of the body, right? The brain knows what your genetic structure is. It knows where there are things that could be a little bit not quite the way we would want them for optimal performance. And the iris shows us that. And the, the constitutional is the foundation of the program that I've created called Dynamic Iridology. Constitutional iridology specifically teaches us that iridology does not give us the answers. It tells us what questions to ask. So when a client comes in and they give me their symptoms that they want my help with, and I look at their eyes or I take photos, I have a special iridology camera, I take photos of their eyes, put those images up on my computer screen so that I can show my client what I'm talking about. I correlate client symptoms their lifestyle and their diet to what I see in their eyes. And that triggers all kinds of questions for me that I can ask to dive deeper to understand what my client's needs are. And from there, then I can help craft, I can work with them to craft a nutrition program, a supplement program, changes in lifestyle to help them regain their health. With constitutional iridology, the iris reveals inherent predispositions. The sclera gives us dynamic predispositions. And background, read, background information is really important for us. We don't do iris readings cold. This is something that is, in my opinion, troublesome. When we look on Facebook, for instance, and we see people posting very poorly done photos, generally speaking, some of the photos are pretty good and they're lobbing them up onto a Facebook site and they say, someone tell me what my, what's wrong in my body. They, we don't have any background information. We can't have a conversation with them really. We don't know how accurate what we're seeing is. And what I mean by that is, when I look at somebody's eyes with my naked eyes, I see the colors the way I see the colors. When I take a photograph with my camera, my camera, even though we've worked hard to set the white balance, it messes with the colors. And then when I upload that to my computers, my computer screens show those images yet differently. So the colors end up switched. They end up a little bit modified. And that can actually give us quite a difference in what kind of an analysis we're going to do. So it's important that we not do iris readings cold. It's important whenever possible that we can actually see the person's eyes. And then yes, we can take photos, but we know how, how different the colors are in our computer screen from what the person's eyes look like. Now I know this to be an absolute fact because I've owned several different iridology cameras. They each generated the images with slightly different color tones. And I have count them four different computer screens, two connected to, to a desktop computer and two laptop computers. Out of those four screens, they all register color differently. And so we need to be very aware of the tech. What color was the light that was shone on the eyes to get the pictures? That will alter the color. How bright was the light? That will alter the color as well. So we want background information. We also want to know if we're taking photos, what the conditions were. Now back to the idea of doing a reading cold. Again, if you don't know anything about the client, what is the tendency that we see online? The tendency is for the people who are doing the analysis, we have no idea what their training is, to spew out long lists of every marker they see, every problem those markers could create, and every possible solution we end up with an unmanageable amount of information where the client is, or the person who posted the images is not going to say, check, 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 check. I agree with all of those and I'm gonna do all of this homework. Um, it's never gonna happen that way. Instead, what is the client gonna do? They're gonna choose one or two things off that list that are either easy to do or that resonate with them. 
and they're going to work on that and ignore the rest when in fact some of the other points may actually be more important and more foundational. So it's really important that when we do iridology, we have that conversation with the client, that we understand where they're coming from, what their history is, what their family history is, so that we have that depth of, of information with which to assess their eyes. Does that all make sense? You ready for an analysis here? All right. So this is a client of mine. She's actually... Uh, what I'm going to tell you is that many of my clients have been with me for 20 to 40 years. Seriously, it's very cool. Even some of my clients, and this includes this client who started with me when I was a Jensenian iridologist. Thank goodness I did enough good for her that she trusts me and she stayed with me through the switch and I still we're still in touch and that's lovely. She's in her mid 50s. And we've been working together for about 38 years. We actually counted it one day. She was one of my very first clients. And um, as we looked at her, her eyes and as we know her history, when she came to me 38 years ago, her skin was a massive problem. And when we look at her eye photos, we see that her skin is an inherent weak link. Now, it is an inherent weak link, and so that means there's going to be a lot of symptoms that show up on her skin, but does that mean that the root of the problem is her skin? In her case, it was not. Back when we started working together, she was having one bowel movement every 10 days. Does that sound healthy to you? She also had incredible PMS. It was, I could kill everybody I see PMS, and she had this really awful skin. And as we looked at things and we looked at this and we saw that, yes, her skin is a weak link. Yes, her bowels could be a weak link. Her digestion is not really strong. And the way she assimilates and transport nutrients appears inherently to also be a bit of a challenge. We then looked at her diet and her diet was quite atrocious. At the time she was 23 years old, she was single and her diet was just awful. So we started fixing the diet. And with the very first changes we did in the first appointment, which wasn't a lot, it was like drink more water, get rid of the coffee and increase your vegetable intake. Uh, that's it and gave her quantities, how many, how big of servings of vegetables, how many in a day, how much water. And literally from first appointment to four weeks later, we got her to where she was having a bowel movement every three days, huge improvement. And she started already to notice her, her menstrual cycle that he, she had in that month, the PMS was much less. It wasn't gone, but it was better. Her skin was starting to improve. When we took these photos just a few years ago, um, as she was hitting her mid 50s, she was having hot flashes and night sweats, and she was not a happy camper with that. And so when we looked at her eyes, we, would, we saw that again inherently, inherently, her liver has an attitude problem. Her liver wants to run or ruin the show, which your liver can do because it does over 500 different jobs. And so we had to go back to what are you doing with her diet? Well, her diet had certainly slipped some. So we had to get her back on track with that. We had to talk about stress and adrenal glands. She's got three um, adult children who are all boys who some of them are semi-pro hockey players things like that. And so she's got some stress on her plate with making sure and, and, you know, trying to follow her kids and all that kind of stuff. And so, and she likes to hold her stress in. She doesn't let it out. She doesn't work it through. And so when we noticed all of that, as we learned all of that, we worked on her diet. That was great. And we got her using some B vitamins and some calcium and some magnesium. And that all seemed to be a great turning point for her. Now, she also then, you know, a year or so later, she came back in and she said, you know, I got this problem. I'm trying to exercise and I'm finding that I, I dribble a lot. I have a bit of incontinence. And so we did a couple of things with her, um, her because her sclera shows that she has a bit of bladder stress. And so we, we got her doing some corn silk and some marshmallow for some herbs. And we sent her to a physiotherapist who specializes in pelvic floor because I suspected she was, 
she was gaining pretty much a, a pretty significant amount of weight. And that's why she was trying to exercise. And I suspected that from her pregnancies and the extra weight she was carrying, that that was the, a part of the problem. And so we got her doing those things. And I don't have all the answers, which is why I sent her out to a pelvic floor physiotherapist to get her um, training her pelvic floor properly to reverse that problem. All right. How's that for you? Does that work? Then we have this darling little girl. Actually, not a little girl. This is the mom of a little girl. This is a second generation client. I helped her mother when her mother was pregnant with this client. And now this client is bringing her babies in. So we have three generations of this family. We were, this client came in to me um, about a year before she wanted to get pregnant. And she had no known fertility issues, which was absolutely brilliant, but she really wanted to be super healthy. And I love that. I love working with women who want to prepare and make sure they're ready for this. So as we look at her eyes, we see that she is inherently predisposed to having elevated acid in her body, though she had no symptoms of that because she has a really clean diet. She's written a, um, a recipe book that was her grandmother's recipes, sort of historical family history uh, comfort food book which was really a cool book. And she, um, she eats all organic, all from scratch. So her diet was really clean and she already was very much on track. So that was exciting. We talked about what, how does she handle stress? She works in the family business, which is a land development business and has a lot of responsibility there. And she tends to suck her stress in, which we can see from her eyes that she's very much an introvert. Introverts tend to hold their stress in close, be a little bit quiet, have walls around them. They only let in the people that they trust. They're not out there for the world to see. And so as we talked about that, we had to talk about ways that as an introvert, she could work at releasing her stress because her stress and sucking it in with what we see in her eyes could lead to some gut issues down the road. And so one of the big things for her was we needed to teach her that particularly during her work day, she needed to actually take time to eat rather than eating at her desk while she was working. So that was a real big change for her because she wanted to get pregnant um, I needed to make sure she was doing the right things for that. So we started working with a great prenatal vitamin. And I wondered if there might be, because of some things that I saw in her eyes, if she might have a bit of a problem with an MTHFR issue. And so I specifically made sure that the prenatal vitamin we used with her had the methylated Bs so that if there was an MTHFR problem, that would be completely addressed. Also suggested that we use digestive enzymes with her that would support her liver because that also can help with the MTHFR thing. She's gone on to have two successful pregnancies, two very successful home births that she was thrilled about, absolutely no complications. However, by the time her youngest child was 12 months, this client came to me in tears and she was really struggling with the stress of being a mom and working in the family business and trying to keep all of these apples, juggle all these apples at the same time, right? And as we look at her eyes, and these are the eyes we took from before she got pregnant, knowing that we had her on a prenatal vitamin that had good mineral content, good vitamin contact, content, we reaffirmed that she was burning through nutrients too quickly because that is her predisposition. That's her inherent predisposition. And so we kept her on that prenatal uh, vitamin and mineral, but we added extra minerals. We added red raspberry leaf to her protocol. We added liquid chlorophyll to her protocol. And she is, uh, it just turned her around when I saw her the next month. She had gone back to being the happy, bubbly, outgoing, resilient young mom that I had met before she got pregnant when she was trying to get ready to get pregnant. 
but we could see that in her eyes that those are the areas that inherently would need support and as we did that we saw everything start to balance out for her and it's just so exciting to see a client that is going from literally downcast uh, very um, just a heavy look in her face and in tears in my office wondering can I actually do this I'm a failure as a mom why do I feel like this and to be able to reassure her that I know she's a darn good mom I've seen her parenting skills and to reassure her that this is depletion and we can deal with it and that she's prone to this we didn't it's not that we didn't expect this we just didn't preempt it well enough right? Let's look at a different type of an eye. This is a true brown eye and a client, a female in her mid fifties. Now, a, I didn't remember her. I worked with her apparently about 20 years before this go around. And she said that I had helped her so tremendously with a persistent and difficult sinus situation. Um, but I did such a good job that she didn't need to come back. And that was great. I love to hear those stories. But now she needed me again. And her issue this time was that she has hot flashes that are really, really disrupting her life. And she wanted to get rid of those. So as we're, we were talking about this, she also mentioned she has mild depression. Now she's a social worker. She knows her stuff. She's got a lot of her ducks in a row. And that is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. She's doing so much right we just needed to work on some tweaks with her. We talked about her diet. She's another one of these clients that has an amazing diet. Like I want to live with her. Her diet is that good, right? Organic from scratch, really fresh, just absolutely wonderful in every way you can think of. As I looked at her eyes, I asked her about her nervous system and about her adrenal glands and about her sympathetic response. Now, because she's a social worker, she understands what I mean when I say sympathetic response. And I asked her about her sleep. I asked her how she regenerates, how does she handle stress? Because those are all things that the eyes are saying could be potential questions here. And I asked her what happens when she gets stressed. And she said, oh, if I don't manage my stress, the hot flashes are like 10 times worse. I just hot flash and I sweat constantly when I'm under stress. So I've learned that when I'm going into a stressful situation, I need to stop, take a few deep breaths and just ground myself and, and just go in and think I can deal with this. This is no big deal. It's nothing I haven't seen before. I can handle this. And then she can really do fairly well. I asked her if she had any problems with her liver. There's a couple of things in her eyes that suggest liver could be issues here. And she wasn't quite sure what that meant. So I asked, did she, how did she handle fats? Was that okay? Yep, she does good with her fats. Anger issues, holding a grudge. No, she had worked that through. So that was brilliant. I asked her about her diet specifically. As I mentioned earlier, there was one thing, one thing that I know was holding her back from feeling marvelous as she's going through these menopausal shifts. And that was that she drinks coffee. Now, I know nothing about coffee. It's not a part of my life. But she, what she described was she drinks Turkish coffee. No idea what that means. And so I asked her if she would do an experiment. She only has one cup a day, right? So that should not be a problem. But I wanted to know. So I asked her if she would do an experiment. And the experiment was can you give up coffee for 10 days just to see how you feel? She did. She did it for 10 days. And when we talked again, she said, I felt marvelous. The hot flashes were completely gone. And I said, okay, so now we've got a choice. I don't have a supplement that is strong enough to override that one cup of coffee. So the choice that you, that you need to be considering is, is the coffee worth it? And if it is, then you need to figure out, is there another choice? And there is, and that other choice is to do hormone replacement therapy with her doctor. And she thought about it for about a New York second. And what she came up with was her diet is so good. She works out regularly. She does so much right. The coffee is the only thing that is not right on, on target. And no, she's not going to give it up. And so with that, I said, 
I'd like to see you continue on a good quality B vitamin complex and a bit of liver support because the liver demands both of those in from what we see in her eyes. And I'm going to suggest then that you do work with a doctor and do something with hormones because I can't take you any further if you're if the coffee is going to be a part of your life. And that was very sad because she saw the difference and she wasn't, didn't want to make the shift, which was very sad. At any rate, love her, gave her good information and off she goes with that, understanding what it means to her and to her health overall. So how do we use iridology then? We use it to guide our questions. We use it to create rapport and we use it to inform our recommendations. So when we're using the eyes and we are doing the assessment, I never have my clients fill out a questionnaire, by the way. I go with what they've told me they want my help with and I go with their eyes. And I use that to tell me what questions do I need to ask to help my client get to where they need to go, right? And we don't do excessive paperwork. Yes, an informed consent form, no to a questionnaire. All right, let's do another analysis. This is a bonus analysis. And then we're just real close to being ready to wrap up tonight. This is a female client. She's in her mid sixties. She's been a client for 38 years as well. This is so cool. I've got so many of these clients that have been with me a long, long time. She came to me originally 38 years ago for help with her children's health. And her children had ear infections and asthma and things like that. And we were able to do some tremendous things with her kids. And then she started coming in for herself. She actually went on to become a herbalist and a nutritionist in her own right. So it's exciting to work with her because we can play off each other to find really good answers for her. Now that she's in her mid-60s, she has problems with her weight. Her cholesterol is high. And she has elevated hemoglobin A1C, which suggests that she is pre-diabetic for type 2 diabetes. Now, her eyes show us inherent potential for liver issues, as well as current issues uh, metabolizing her carbohydrates, as well as a strong suggestion that she probably has the MTHFR problem that we mentioned earlier as well. When we look at her eyes, she clearly has the indications that she burns through her B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium very, very quickly. She's had a lot of stress. For about the past 15 years, she's been caring for aging family members, her mom, her uncle, her husband is now unwell with a terminal terminal illness that the doctors cannot give a prognosis on. And so she's constantly under stress with, you know, helping with her kids and the problems they've got and all kinds of stuff. And so we needed to get to the root of this. So started working with her food, started cleaning up her diet because she'd really become the low man on the totem pole. Everybody else got the best of everything else. And she was kind of living on the dregs. So we worked with her to get her to understand that this is an oxygen mask situation. She needs to take care of herself in order to be able to take care of everyone else. And she totally got it. So this is good, taking better care of herself. We put her at her age, we put her on a prenatal vitamin because it has the right vitamins and minerals for her and it has the methylated Bs. She chuckled, I chuckled, but she understands because of her background why we did that. It wasn't because we thought she was going to get pregnant because she clearly isn't. It's because it's one of the best vitamins I've ever found for women, especially women that might have the MTHFR issue. We suggested that um, she needs to get out for walks every day. She needs some time away from her husband. While her husband has a terminal illness, he's well enough, he can be left alone. But she needs to have time by herself. And if walking is good for her, then she needs to be walking every day if that's the way she needs to get her alone time. But we really talked about the importance of her self-care in that way. We also, for her, specifically added N-acetylcysteine and milk thistle to help with her liver phase one and phase two detox. She had a lot of symptoms that really made me feel like 
that's the direction we needed to go, that her liver was getting bogged down. And that's what was causing a lot of problems for her. We also, for her, added some berberin to help her with her blood sugars while she's getting her diet worked out, while she is relearning how to feed herself, how to be the priority for food preparation. That it's really her needs that matter most. And I don't mean that to sound harsh, but the, the corrections that we were doing with her diet, I actually got photos of her husband's eyes. She brought her husband in so I could do that, so I could help her with her husband. And the diet recommendations we were making for this client were solid for her husband. So if they could work together to do these diet changes, it could show tremendous benefits for both of them. So that was pretty exciting. All right. Any questions on any of this so far? The eyes are so exciting to work with and it's so fun and rewarding to use the eyes in a clinical situation. With that, I'd like to spend just no more than five minutes introducing you to the program that I alluded to earlier, the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System. It, this is a program that I've created that teaches constitutional iridology for holistic health practitioners. It is specifically for herbalists, nutritionists, naturopaths, people who work professionally in the holistic health industry. And this is the only live online fully mentored course to teach holistic practitioners iridology and how to use iridology in their clinic. I had a conversation yesterday with a soon to be student and she has studied with two other iridology instructors whose names will remain unmentioned. And I've had students from some of these instructors as well. And this woman's complaint was that while they taught her iridology, they did not teach her how to use it. And that's a really important distinction here. It's something that I really stress as we are learning iridology, we practice how to use it. It does no good to know how to assess an eye if you don't know what to do with that, right? So we make sure that our students, when they finish the course, have that foundation. If you're on my email list already, if you've been receiving emails from me, great. You will be notified when registration is open for the next go round of the course. If I don't have your email address already, you can PM me or DM me, regardless of which social media platform you're on. I'm all over Instagram. I'm all over Facebook. You can send me your email address and I'll make sure you get added so that when the next course comes up, if you're interested, we can have a conversation about it. You can absolutely connect with me on Facebook at Iridology Education and on Instagram at iridology.education. I'll give you a minute to get those, uh, take a screenshot of that if you wanna keep in touch with me. Now, if you've been hanging out with me for a while already, just like the student I talked with yesterday, she's been hanging out with me for about a year, which is great, I love it but she now wants to be a student. She wants to be in my, in, in my circle of influence. And I love that. I learned so much from my students anyways that I welcome them. If, but if you've been hanging with me for a while and if you're pretty sure you want to enroll in the next course that starts on January 28th, I encourage you to use this link to book an insight call and we'll have a chat and make sure that this is actually a really good fit for you. This isn't a sales call, it's not a high pressure technique. It's to find out if this is a good fit for you. And uh, if you're brand new to me and you're going, I'm really looking for an iridology class, book a call. Let's have a conversation. Again, let's see if this is a good fit for you. And so um, with this, again, I, I just encourage you to reach out to me. Let's talk. Reach out to me on social media, on Facebook or on Instagram. Let's have a conversation. Let's start your education through social media and get you feeling like, yeah, yeah, this could be great and you want to know more and stay in touch with me. With that, I thank you so much for being with me today. And just before we wrap up, are there any questions? I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you for spending this hour with me. 
I've had fun. I hope you've had fun. I hope it's been informative for you. And I do look forward to being in touch. Thanks so much and bye for now.